In the yoga system, the mind and the conditioned soul are especially important. Since the mind is the central point of the yoga practice, Atma refers here to the mind. The purpose of the yoga system is to control the mind and to draw it away from attachment to sense object. It is stressed herein that the mind must be so trained that it can deliver the conditioned soul from the mire of missions. In material existence, one is subjected to the influence of the mind and the senses. In fact, the pure soul is entangled in the material world because the mind is involved with the false ego, which desires to lord over material nature. Therefore, the mind should be trained so that it will not be attracted by the glitter of material nature. And in this way, the conditioned soul may be saved. One should not degrade oneself by attraction to sense objects, the more one is attracted by sense object, the more one becomes entangled in material existence. The best way to disentangle oneself is to always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. The word he is used for emphasizing this point, that one must do this. It is also said, for man, mind is the cause of bondage and mind is the cause of liberation. Mind absorbed in sense object is the cause of bondage and mind detached from the sense object is the cause of liberation. Therefore, the mind which is always engaged in Krishna consciousness is the cause of supreme liberation. Om Ajnati Mirandasya Jnananjana Shalakya Chakshur Unmilitam Mena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vancha Kalpat Rupyasya Rupa Sindhu Vyayavacha Patithanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnava Pyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabho Nityananda Sri Hadvaitya Gadadha Sri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 One must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So quite a serious topic, right? So this particular verse, very important verse, comes from the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which is entitled Dhyana Yoga. Dhyana Yoga. In this chapter, Lord Krishna explains 
about the eightfold yoga system unfortunately in the west the yoga is synonymous to the physical exercise right but the word yoga has a very deep meaning the yoga means to connect ourselves to something higher something spiritual something you know like better than what is in the material world and to do that connection we cannot do that connection at a bodily level physical level it has to happen at a mental level or the level of the mind and that's what krishna is talking in this sixth chapter of bhagavad gita now to connect ourselves to the spirit to your world we have to get our physical body fit first because if your physical body is not fit then you can't do any yoga so this eight fold yoga system what krishna is speaking the first four step are meant for to keep our physical body fit and those steps are known as yam niyam asan and pranayam so yam and niyam means following the rules and regulation and what are those rules and regulation there are many of them no meat eating no gambling no illicit relationship no intoxication be truthful be honest clean be you know, cleanliness these are all part of the yam and niyam and once we follow yam and niyam now we are ready for exercise that is known as asan and once we do the exercise properly body is fit then we can do the pranayam which is a breathing exercise so by doing these four steps it means we are we have a prerequisite for yoga system now imagine if the yoga studios which are there all over the world right if they try to enforce yam and niyam before somebody does exercise most yoga studios will go out of business right because nobody wants to follow yam and niyam but unless one follows the rules and regulation even if you do physical exercise it doesn't have much benefit you might get little benefit but the real benefit you cannot get even at a material level so following yam niyam and then pranayam and asan and pranayam is the critical so most yoga studios they they are at this first four step of the uh, um, ashtanga yoga if you look at the dietitians nutritionists they follow in the category of yam and niyam they try to control your diet and everything if you look at the yoga instructor physical exercise instructor they come under the three and four which is asan and pranayam now once you are ready with the physical body now the real yoga starts which is to get our mind ready for the uh, for the yoga system so the first step is the fifth step which is now to control the mind is known as pratyahar pratyahar means to empty out our mind since time immemorial we have built a lot of like you know toxic rubbish things within our mind now we need to empty out that first suppose if you want to renovate your home what do you do first thing you get all your furniture out all your drugs out carpet out you know window treatment out put it on a garage sale right get it out of the home first <laughs> so same way this pratyaharam is get all our thoughts out now the mind is empty now the mind can you keep it empty no, no because idle mind is there is workshop so you have to fill in something you have to buy new furniture new rugs right so you go for shopping and you look for something good furniture or good rugs same way now you bring the good thoughts good you know instruction in your mind and that is known as the seventh sixth step which is known as dharana dharayate means to bring some good thoughts within your mind all right now you brought the good thoughts within your mind like you brought the good furniture within your house now what are you going to do let's say i mean you are going to use the furniture feel it and you know, enjoy it right same way when the good thoughts are inside our mind now we have to start contemplating on those thoughts you know think about those thoughts and and that is known as meditation or dhyana so that is the seventh step of the yoga ladder and the last step is the perfection of meditation or perfection of dhyana which is known as samadhi or sometimes it's referred to as turiya that is the complete absorption in a particular thought when you are not aware of anything which is happening around you you are like completely oblivious to whatever happens around you if you remember parikshit maharaj when he went to the hermitage of the great sage shamik rishi shamik rishi was in trance he didn't even get up to invite welcome to the king parikshit maharaj why because shamik rishi was in samadhi or the incomplete trance he was connected at a level of mind he was connected to the supreme so that is the last step of the 
Ashtanga Yoga. And that's what Krishna explains. So the first four steps, which is meant for the physical body, is generally referred as Ashtanga Yoga. Sorry, it is generally referred as Hatha Yoga. And the last step, four steps, which are meant for the mental level, they are referred to as Dhyana Yoga. So Hatha Yoga plus Dhyana Yoga together is known as Ashtanga Yoga. And that's what Krishna explains in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Now, unfortunately, the word yoga is misrepresented and in the name of yoga, people, you know, they have been taking advantage of people, they cheat people, right? So a few years back in California, you know, California, there are a lot of rich, rich ladies, you know, they, they would like to go for yoga. And whenever they go for yoga, right, they always take their dogs with them. Now, what that dog is going to do when the master is doing the yoga for an hour, two hours, right? So the dog is going to sit down, like, cannot sit down. So the yoga studio owner came out with a brilliant idea. So they said, okay, master is doing a yoga on this room. So they would, they came out with a new yoga for the dogs. It's called Doga. You know? <laughs> and it's not, I mean, you can Google it and find there are a lot of women. So Doga, so they take all the dogs to the other room and they will make dogs go around and they like shake its like legs or you know, like make, shake its like a tail. And sometimes two dogs will face to face, they will bark at each other, it's like a kapalabhati, you know. So this, is, so this is, and the best part of it is, the, the, all the masters were happy because the dogs are engaged in yoga. And the yoga studio owners are happy also because they have double revenue now. One from yoga, one from doga, you know. So this is the cheating going on. You know. October 1st, as you know, is a big festival in Germany, you know, right, right? And especially in the Munich and surrounding area of Germany, it's a big festival. And every year, thousands of people go to Munich, you know, to drink and enjoy. That's the October 1st. So the yoga studios in Munich area, they thought, okay, we have, we have to take advantage of this tourism because so many people come, so what do we do? So they came out with the new yoga a few years back. It's called beer yoga. <laughs> and sometimes they advertise as yoga on tap, you know. <laughs> so, what they do is whenever you go to this studio, they immediately give you a bottle of okay. beer, local beer. And then you hold that bottle and do exercise. You have to balance the bottle and in between the instructor will take, say, take a sip. So you keep doing that for an hour or two and after two hours, everyone is in samadhi. You know? <laughs> so, of course, it's a different type of samadhi. But people like it, and now they're bringing that whole beer you got in America also. <laughs> so this is the type of cheating going on in the market. But what Krishna is explaining is something totally different. Yoga means to connect ourselves to the Supreme Lord, Supreme. And that for that, we have to get our mind ready. And this is all the sixth chapter talks about the yoga system. So now, the verse which we chanted, there's one word which comes often, you know, which is repeated several times. What is that word? Atma. Atma, right? So, the word Atma has several meanings. Generally, Atma refers to the soul, but Atma also can refer to the mind. Atma also can refer to the body. So the words which we chanted today, there are seven times the word Atma comes. Uddharet Atma Natma Nam Natma Nam Avasadeet so seven times the word Atma comes. Four times, Prabhupada translates Atma as a mind and three times as the body. So this shows the scripture should be translated by a pure devotee of the Lord and not just by linguist. Because pure devotees, they know the contextual meaning of each word of Sanskrit because Sanskrit is a very powerful language where each word can mean several things depending upon the context. So unless a devotee, uh, a devotee understands that, that's why he can translate it better. I think I had told this story about, you know, suppose there is a, say, a cookbook in a Hindi language, which was written a long time back. And now there's a linguist who is an expert in both Hindi and English, and he wants to translate that book, cookbook from Hindi into English. At the same time, there's an old lady in India who has used this cookbook for 50 years. She has cooked every recipe from that book and she knows everything what that book means. But she's not a linguist, she's not a great scholar in English, but she wants to translate that book into English. Now, whose book is more valuable? Which one will you buy? 
the one which is written by the old lady because she knows the contextual meaning of each spice, each word in that book, right? So that is why the book written by a pure devotee like Srila Prabhupada is much more important than just a scholar's you know, representation of Bhagavad Gita. And I think I also mentioned about the Max Muller, you know, like the great Indologist who was a great Sanskrit scholar from Oxford University. Even today in India, many like uh, cities, there is a Max Muller Bhavan, you can see, you know, named after him. And Max Muller, he translated practically all Vedas into English. He was not a devotee, he was a scholar, linguist. And one of the verses from the Vedas, he translated as, if a sannyasi wants to progress on the path of spiritual life, then he should kill a cow every day. <laughs> that was his translation. Now, from linguistically, it's perfect. But from a cultural point of view, you know, it was a disaster. What does it mean? Because the word which was used in that verse was go. Go means cow and go means senses. So what that verse was trying to say is if a sannyasi wants to progress on the path of spiritual, he should kill his senses. It means he should control his senses on a daily basis. But because it was translated by language, it was a complete disaster. So today's words also, if it was, suppose it was, if it was translated by a linguist, how we would have translated, right? A mind should not, mind should elevate by mind, mind, no, soul should elevate by the soul, soul should not degrade by the soul, soul is the greatest friend of the soul, and soul is the biggest enemy of the soul. And what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything, right? So that's why the important is that the pure devotee's translation, which we should accept. Now, in this verse, Krishna says, one must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the best friend of the conditioned soul and the worst enemy as well. Now, is the mind is a friend or enemy or frenemy? You know, friend and enemy, like sometimes in the Bond movie, you know, some lady will be there who acts like a friend, but she's a spy, like a frenemy, you know? So what is mind is? Mind is a frenemy, enemy, or friend, right? So actually, mind is like an instrument. And instrument is a friend or an enemy, depends upon who is handling it. For example, if you have a knife, you now you give it to the hand, in the chef's hand, then the knife is a great friend. It can cut vegetables in five minutes and you can cook. But the same knife, if you give it to the child's hand, is a disaster, right? It can damage the, it can hurt the child and also everyone who is around him. Why? Because its knife itself is not an enemy or the friend, it's the person who is operating it or the person who is handling it. Similarly, the mind is also like that. The mind is a friend or enemy, Krishna says, depends upon us who is operating it. Another example is car or vehicle, all of us have a vehicle, right? Now, is it a friend or enemy? Again, depends who is driving it. <laughs> right? It can be friend if it is in a good hands. It can be enemy if it is in wrong hands. So the mind itself is not a friend or enemy. It depends upon us. So in these words, Krishna says, your mind can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Krishna doesn't say just the enemy. He says worst enemy. Now, why mind is the worst enemy? Think about it. Now, if you have an enemy in this world, what can that enemy do to you? He might steal your money, it, he can create some damage to your house, or he can damage your reputation, or he can do something. The worst thing the enemy can do to you is he can kill you, right? Now, once he kills you, now there is no more relation between you and the enemy. Because now you are going through the transmigration process, and then you have a new body and the person who killed your enemy you know, he suffers his karmic reactions and he has a transmigration process through the animal life and everything but you are not going to come face to face again that's it that's the end of enemy right enmity think about the mind the mind if it is an enemy in this life it's going to instruct you wrong it's going to guide you wrong and it's going to torture you all your life and it's to the point that mind is going to kill you this life now, is that over? No, because when we die, we give up our physical body, gross body, which is made out of earth, water, fire, air, ether. We don't give up mind, intelligence, and ego. Because mind, intelligence, ego is carried to the next life. That's the whole transmigration process. 
Of course, the material nature formats that mind for the new life, but still the impression from this life is still on the mind. And that is generally referred to as kutam. And because of this impression, even in next life, because you are carrying the same mind, it will st again start torturing you and you know guide you, you, you guide you wrong, and again it will kill you. So mind is not killing just one life, but it's going to kill you life after life. So is there enemy any enemy like that in this world? No, that's why mind is considered as the worst enemy. Now at the same time, Krishna says mind can be your best friend. Why? Suppose if you have a friend, what can your friend do to you? He can probably lend you some money, he can give you some advice, he can help you in something. That's it, right? Beyond, he cannot take care of your birth, old age, disease and that. No. That's pretty much what he can do. But if mind is the best friend, he can liberate you from this cycle of birth, death, old age, disease, death. And you, he, he can put you on a platform where you can always be happy, always in blissful mood, ananda. So no other friend can do this to you. That's why mind is considered the best friend. So again, it depends upon whether we want to make it the best friend or the best, you know, worst enemy. Now the question comes, all right, mind can be a friend or enemy, right? Now how can we make mind as our friend? How can we start friendship with the mind, right? If you see Bhagavad Gita verses, there is one thing Krishna repeatedly tells in several verses, especially in some of the important verses in Bhagavad Gita, that Mai Arpita Mano Buddhi. And you can check. So many verses he says that Mai Arpita Mano Buddhi. It means you engage your mind and intelligence in the service of Krishna so that mind can be your friend. Now, mind as full of desires. Mind is a function of some kalpa vikalpa, you know, like it's accepts and rejects all the time. But it's accepting and rejecting also is part of mind's desire. And intelligence is always discriminates. This is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong. And Krishna is saying, repeated in Bhagavad Gita, you engage your faculty of desires and faculty of discrimination in his service. That way, mind can be your friend, right? Now, what does it mean? to offer our mind to Krishna. If I had to offer flowers to Krishna, I can see it, I can feel it, I can offer it, right? If I had to offer a sh like a money also, I can offer it. But what does it mean to offer our mind to Krishna? Mind is more subtle than the empty space. Come on. So how can you offer the mind to Krishna? It says if you, are to, if you have to offer your mind to Krishna, it means you have to offer what is inside your mind. The problem is what is inside our mind? We don't even know that also. Mind is subtle, then what is inside the mind? Say you want to offer a sugar or rice to the Lord. Right? Sometimes people bring sugar or rice. Now you want to offer it. Now you buy a bag of sugar or rice and offer it. Now what did you offer? Did you offer rice or the bag? Rice and the bag. Both you offer, right? Your intention is to offer the rice, but bag also comes along with that. So mind is like this container, actually, like a bag. And what is inside the mind is our emotions. Mm. So when Krishna says, you offer your mind, we offer our emotions to Krishna. All of us have emotions. I like someone, I like, uh, I like certain food, I like to smell something, I like to see something, I like to hear something, I like to, you know, all these emotions we have. So Krishna says that you engage your emotions in his service. That way mind, so that is same as offering your mind to Krishna. Now the problem is, can we offer all our emotions to Krishna? Like I like to eat something which is not prescribed. Can I offer that to Krishna? No. All our emotions cannot be offered to Krishna. For that intelligence is required what to offer and what not to offer. That's why Krishna says, Mai, Arpita, Mano and Buddhi also. You offer your mind with the help of the intelligence. See in the office also, right? Sometimes your manager, boss, you know, always tells you, right? Don't be emotional, be rational, right? How many of you have heard that? Be, don't be emotional, be rational. What does it mean? Don't use just your mind, but use your intelligence also. So Krishna is also say, he's saying here, Mai Arpita Mano Buddhi, offer your mind with the help of intelligence. And that is what is required. And if we can do that, then mind can be our best friend. If the mind is our best friend, then there won't be any more suffering. 
Now this brings to our question of our presentation, which is the most important. Devotees offer their mind, emotions to Krishna. So do devotees really suffer them? Or do then why are you, why devotees are suffering or do devotees really suffer? That's the question. Now, suffering is a big topic. We cannot you know, do it in the next 20 minutes. You know, there are many people who believe that there is no God in this world because there is suffering. In fact, there are great religious people because of some setbacks in their life, they, they turned out to be one of the greatest atheists. Charles Darwin, all of us know, who we studied in school, right? He was a devout Christian. He was very religious until he lost his daughter, Annie, who died at a very young age. And Darwin couldn't digest this. How can God take away my daughter, Annie, such a young age? And then he started thinking and thinking and then ultimately came to conclusion that there cannot be God. So much so that he devoted the rest of his life to prove that there is no God. And towards the end of his life, he came out with the theory called Darwin's theory of evolution to prove that, to say that, not prove, to say that, that the man is created by the evolution and not by God. So God is not in control. So this is exactly opposite what Bhagavatam says. Bhagavatam says is, there is a theory of devolution. From Brahma, it comes all the way down. But Darwin says that there is a theory of evolution. From amoeba, there are human beings. Exactly opposite. Why? Because there was a suffering. See, there was a, once there was a devotee who was visiting a doctor who was an atheist doctor, you know. And by looking at devotee's dress, the doctor asked him, do you believe in God? And the devotee said, yes, I do believe in God. The doctor said, there cannot be God. There's so much suffering in this world. Why do you believe that there is no God? It cannot be possible. If God is all loving, then there cannot be God because there is suffering. And as the devotee was leaving the clinic, there was an old man sitting right in front of the clinic. He had some disease. He was coughing very badly and he was suffering. And by looking at him, the devotee immediately went back to the clinic and told the doctor, you know what? There is no doctor in this town at all. The doctor said, what do you mean? I just treated you. No, he said, come, look at this person. Because there is a disease, there cannot be doctor in this world. The doctor said, no. He has a disease, but he has not come to me. That's why he's suffering. If he comes to me, I would have cured, right? The disease. And the devotee said, that's exactly the point is. People are suffering because they are not going to the God. People are suffering in this world because they are not following the will of the God. And that's why there is suffering. If they follow the will, then there is no suffering. So, devotees always follow the will of the Lord. So then why there is suffering? What so-called suffering for the devotees, right? See, for that we have to understand what is suffering. Why there is a root cause of the suffering. From a practical perspective, what is the cause for the suffering? If you analyze it in detail, you'll understand that attachment is the cause of suffering. Of course, attachment comes from the avidya or the ignorance. Kunti Marani says that avidya kama kama vi. That because of ignorance, there is attachment and because of attachment, there is a suffering. Now, attachment from our perspective, attachment is the cause of suffering. Now, how attachment is the cause of suffering, right? Just take an example. Say sorry, there is some game going on in the field. Like Super Bowl, two weeks back, right? There is who are Patriots against Falcons. They're playing finals. Now when the game was over, there are many people felt miserable and suffered, right? And there are many people who felt happy and joyful. And there was a third category, for them it didn't matter at all. And probably those are, that's the category we came to for the Sunday feast. Right? It didn't matter. Now what's the difference? Same way if we are going to India, right? Cricket is the biggest sports. And if suppose if India is playing against uh, like one of its main rivals, and if India loses, the whole country is in mourning, you know? They like really in depression. Now if an American is visiting, Amer if an American is visiting India at that time, now for him it doesn't matter, he's not suffering because he doesn't, he doesn't care for cricket. So what is creating the suffering? It's not the game or the events happening on the field cannot create the suffering. It's our emotional investment in that event. And Krishna explains this concept very well in the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. He says, 
कार्य कार्य कारण कर्तव्य हेतु प्रकृति उच्चते इस इस कार्य एंड कारण अगर the cause and the effect what is happening in this world the ball is getting hit somebody is splashing the water somebody is dropping you know like whatever is happening in this world is all happening in the realm of matter material world but purusha sukha dukkha na the, the living entity feels the happiness and distress why not because of the event itself but bhoktratve hetu ruchate because of the attachment to that event that's simple If there is don't have attachment, no suffering at all. Take another example. Say you have a car, brand new car, and you go to a mall, and as you are parking, somebody was backing up or somebody is opening the door, and there is a big scratch on your car. Of course, you suffer, right? Oh, it's my car, my car. You know, hurt. It hurts. Now, after a month or a year, you sold that car. Now you are in the mall, and this new owner with your old car is in the mall. Is parking and somebody is hitting that car. Does now do you suffer at that time? No. What happened? Is the same car, same model, everything. You don't suffer. So what? What changed? Your emotional investment is not there. That's why there is no more suffering. So that's the key to understand whether do, when when we say do devotees really suffer? Devotees really don't suffer because there is no emotional investment. in the material things the odis understand that i am the soul or atma i am not this body in fact this is the first instruction krishna gives as soon as the arjuna surrenders in the second chapter seventh verse that's the first instruction and since the odis do understand that they do not have the emotional investment in the material body or material body related things the odis also have the suffering they go through disease sometimes they have financial problems sometimes they have problem with the relationship legal problems so many problems but they are all connected with the body this way and because they don't have a emotional investment in the body they do not suffer now of course the word devotee is a broad term that not everybody is at that final level right all of us are at a different stages 5% 10% 15% like that so to the extent we have realized that we are not that body not this body to that extent we will not have emotional investment and to that extent we will not suffer in this world because of any events now that doesn't mean devotees are careless because if there's a disease they do take care of it if there's a legal problem they have to take care of it all these things have to be taken care of but the devotees when these events are happening they are not emotionally invested but these events They, it doesn't create a suffering but it creates some kind of inconvenience for them so there's a difference between inconvenience and the suffering right suppose you are tomorrow morning you are going to your office and on the way you have a flat tire now do you suffer depends actually it's a inconvenience because it you might be late for your meetings or something and you have to call or you have to change the tire it's an inconvenience for you now day after tomorrow you are driving to the office and you meet an accident you fracture your leg No, is that suffering? Yes. No, that's a suffering. Now, what's the difference between day one and day two? Day one events happen not on your body, and day two happen on your body. So that's why day one is more of an inconvenience, and day two is more of a suffering. So devotees, when they understand that I am not this body, Krishna says that in Bhagavad Gita, Yantra Rudani Maya, because we are living entities, Atma, soul, and we are driving this body called yantra or you know like made out of maya the illusory energy and to the extent devotees understand that then it's like for them any disease or legal problems or financial problems or relationship problems is like having a flat tire you know yes it's an inconvenient but it doesn't stop them so they are concerned but they are not worried about the problems so that is the first thing we have to understand is they do not have emotional investment the second thing is because they understand i am not this body i am atma their actions what they do it doesn't create more suffering right because they understand what is the real goal of life in fact if you see in a bhakti rasamrit sindhu rupa goswami says that when you understand that you are not this body and start practicing devotional service the very first thing the quality of the pure devotional service is klesha ni 
that means it burns all your karma so when the karmas are burnt that means you have less suffering so a devotee suffering you cannot say is same as non devotee suffering if you go to a hospital for example there are two patients patient 1 is suffering patient 2 is also suffering patient 1 his disease is not diagnosed so he is not under the care of a doctor patient 2 his disease is diagnosed and is under the care of a doctor now patient 2 because he is following the rules and regulations prescribed by the doctor his future prospectus is very bright whereas the patient one since he has no clue about the disease and he is not surrendered to any doctor what happens is he might do certain things he might act few th uh, things in this world which might aggravate the disease so devotees are under the shelter of a spiritual master devotees are the shelter under the shelter of a scriptures that's why their future is much more brighter and there is there won't be as much suffering as the non devotees so that's the point number 2 the third there is a huge difference between attitude towards the problem for the you know for the devotees and non devotees suppose you are in like new york city you are standing right in front of empire state building and the building looks so big right so many people when they come across a problem in their life they look at the problem like that oh my god it's so big right so that's it. so and then they go to lord and they say god i have such a big problem please help actually we should not tell god how big is our problem but rather we should tell problem how big is our god right think about it because so now how can you minimize that you know how can you look at the problem in a different way now you are in manhattan again in front of that empire state building right now suddenly you have a, you have opportunity to get on the chopper or helicopter or a plane now you rise to 30000 feet level now how does that empire state look like to you it looks very tiny right now what happened you just elevated yourself to the higher level so krishna consciousness is actually lifts lifts you at a mental level to higher level a spiritual level and when you are at that level this material problems you see them but it doesn't bother you you look at it in a different your attitude towards the problem completely changes you understand problems are there but problems have a beginning and problems have an end but i as the atma or the soul i can go beyond the problem because i'm eternal i don't have a beginning and i don't have a end so that is the attitude of devotees towards the problem because of this attitude devotees don't suffer like the non devotees the fourth point as far as the suffering is concerned they devotees when they are practicing krishna consciousness they have a proper default thought now what does default thought means see if you are a, if you are in the midst midst of a crisis or a problem this problem sticks to your mind all the time you keep thinking about your problem it's like a rocking chair you keep rocking and rocking for one hour where does the chair go so it's right there it doesn't go anywhere right so the problems they stick to mind and it doesn't go away at all but if you are practicing krishna consciousness and again this problems because it sticks to mind all the time it actually like saps it takes away all our energy but if you are practicing krishna consciousness seriously then yes you have taken care of your problems but the default thought is not the problem but krishna consciousness and that gives a huge relief for you right in fact our progress in krishna consciousness is measured by what is our default thought think about it scripture says that we have to be 24 hours krishna consciousness how is it possible yes we might do like 2 hours of chanting maybe some reading and you know deity worship maximum 3 hours we can focus on krishna like well but then you go to work and if you are a doctor it's not recommended that you have a chanting beads on one hand and the other hand you have a knife and you know like a like a scissors and do a surgery no that's not 24 hours krishna consciousness that's not recommended if you are a doctor do your surgery with complete focus if you are an accountant do it properly but once that surgery is done what are you thinking what is your default thought 
Once your work is okay, you are a software engineer, you did a coding, what's your default thought after that? For most people, for most people, once the work is done, the default thought is whom should I move? Where should I go? What should I drink? How should I make more money? You know, that's the default thought. But if you are in Krishna consciousness, your default thought becomes okay, what should should I read now? What should, how should I chant? Should I chant more round? Should I go to and talk to some devotees? You know, like these are our default thoughts. Even when you get inside the car immediately from the work, immediately you feel like turning on some uh, lecture or the you know, kirtan. Why? Because that's our default thought. And to the extent Krishna consciousness is our default thought, to that extent we can say that we have advanced. So default thought is the most important in our life. So if you look at all these four points, they are all at the level of mind, mental level. And if we, if, if we make mind as our friend, then we won't suffer in this world. And mind will help us to liberate us from this world. So the controlling the mind is the most critical piece of our life. And that is why Srila Prabhupada came here 50 years ago. He gave a simple process. If we follow strictly, we can make that mind as our best friend rather than the enemy and that way we can go back to the spiritual world and where we can eternally be happy with the Krishna. So, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare. 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 One quick question. Anybody? Yes, please. Namaste. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu, for your class. Um, I had a question. Um, I really like the point you made at the end about the default thought, um, but I find that uh, that it's difficult to keep that default thought like all the time because, like for example, like on a Friday, on a Friday night, like after or Friday after work or something, your default thought, at least mine, isn't like something really super Krishna conscious because it's kind of like an enjoying propensity because you're off work and you're just you know, the week is over. So my question is, how do we, how do we consistently keep the default thought to be? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If you look at it again, yes, after Friday, you worked very hard and you want to, you know, enjoy, like you want to have some relaxation time. But again, emotions, no, now we have emotions, right? Now you want to share that emotion with others, you want to relax. But the thing is that also, you want to have some recreation or something. If we can do that, under the purview of Krishna consciousness, that can be your default thought. All of us have a bhakti raksha, right? Many of us have a bhakti raksha. That's actually default thought. Because Fridays we go and do we enjoy? Yes, we have big prasadam and everything, right? And sometimes it goes till midnight and Mataji is cooked like a tea and coffee, you know, her, like a decaf coffee and everything. So it goes on for midnight. Now, one way you can say it's an enjoyment, but still it's a default thought because it's under the guidelines of Krishna consciousness. So that way, recreation also can be part of our life, but as long as it's part of our Krishna consciousness movement. So that can be default. Thought. We go for picnic, like yearly, right? But still, it's a default thought. We don't go to picnic for, you know, we go to picnic with devotees and we chant and have a prasad and everything. So all can be Krishna conscious, you know, so as default thought. Any other question? Quick question? Yes. Yes, please. Whole concept of <laughs> okay. so I said this whole concept of mind being the enemy, right? When we think in the material context, whether it's a mind or a friend, it's usually another living entity, right? Another soul. You are caused by other living entity. Mm -hmm. But in that context, the mind cannot be classified as a living entity. Mind? Mind, mind doesn't have an independent no, existence. No, no. It doesn't have a mind of its own. Yeah. <laughs> mind is not a, yes, it's part of the subtle body. It's, right. it's, it's linked to the soul. Right. So when we say the mind is the enemy, who are we talking about? Mind is an enemy. I mean, we're talking, it's, it's not like another, but it's our own mind is creating, giving you wrong direction. So. I mean, for practical purpose, we, we, what we say, we act as if the mind is a separate living entity because 
to give you know otherwise we won't be able to explain in the class at all so mind is sometimes like give reference as a separate entity but mind is actually us is part of the subtle body in other words we are can be a we are yes entity. absolutely yes. yes it's not like a <laughs> but mind is sometimes reported as in mind e or like you know like to just to say as if it's a separate body but it's part of our subtle body just just to add to that just the notion of uh, what is the mind and if it's not separate from us it is one sense separate from us yeah. but what see mind is a repository of our desires like we're saying our emotions but those emotions came about because we made decisions as the soul to always make decisions put this not put that put this and as that developed into our whole album of our desires and repository so that mind is actually a, it's a dead thing in one sense yeah. but it reflects or it's reflective of all the choices we have we made, are made yes. in many lifetimes yes. that is why it's actually us in one sense but also not us correct yes Yes, it's like it's like a computer. You have some memory stick, yeah. so you know, like it comes photos, from different. All yes. the photos you have put, that's yes. the mind. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.